Sure. Uh, I'm Randy Barnett. I'm the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at the Georgetown University Law Center, where I also direct the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. Sure. Uh, well, I was um, a. I went to Harvard Law School after being a philosophy major at Northwestern, and after law school, became a criminal lawyer as a prosecutor for the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, and it's what I went to law school to become. I went to law school to be a criminal lawyer after watching the television show The Defenders with uh, E.G. Marshall, and uh, ended up on the prosecution side rather than the defense side, and considered myself as a lawyer to be a trial lawyer, someone who could argue jury trials, and then I went into teaching a little over 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, the prosecutor's obligation is to do justice, which means that if you believe somebody is not guilty, you're not supposed to prosecute them. And um, I was there uh, in law enforcement to see that the bad guys uh, went to jail and that the good guys didn't. So that was what drew me there, as well as kind of the general excitement of uh, doing trial work. Um, when I was a philosophy major at Northwestern, I actually toyed with the idea of being a philosophy professor. Uh, but then, um, thinking about it for a while longer, I went back to plan A and, and to be a lawyer. Uh, but when I was in law school, I kind of realized that uh, I could, as a law professor, I could write about the very sorts of things I was interested in doing as a philosophy professor. And so maybe one day I'd be a law professor. I, I just didn't really have a, a real clue as to how hard it was to get a job as a law professor. and. Uh, uh, how competitive that was. Yeah, well actually the answer to that is is pretty simple and it unifies all of my work and that is an interest in justice um, uh, in general and liberty in particular. So uh, those are the themes that have always driven my career. I became, I wanted to become a lawyer. Well, the reason why the Defenders as a TV show turned me on is because they were, I could see that lawyers were, they, it was a job dealing with justice. And when I got to college, I discovered philosophy, which I had really never heard of as a high school student. And I discovered that for thousands of years, people have been writing about justice. So um, that's really what's always motivated everything that I've done uh, as an adult. And um, basically, there's a difference between doing justice retail as a lawyer, case by case, and, and trying to uh, uh, effectuate a more just society wholesale by writing about it and hoping that you know, what you have to say about it would actually affect the system as a whole. Maybe the easiest way to sum up um, how it, the, what I do fits together is uh, based on my first book, which is called The Structure of Liberty, Justice and the Rule of Law. That lays out um, in general, what I think justice is, and in particular, that means the enforcement of, of particular individual rights that I defend in that book, uh, as well as the rule of law, and why both are important. Um, and from there, if you look at my constitutional law scholarship, it's how a written constitution enforced according to its original meaning um, can be a means to the end of protecting the individual liberty and rights of the people. Um, and so that's the way the two things sort of fit together. Uh, no, I mean a written constitution itself is not essential, uh, but, if you, but a written constitution is useful and it's useful to provide the law that governs those who govern us, to keep those who are responsible for law enforcement um, uh, themselves uh, subject to the law. And that means that putting it in writing uh, helps effectuate that. And it also means that the people who are subject to that law, which are the government themselves, are not the people who ought to be able to change it. So they can't change it they ha in order to change the law. So the courts can't change it. They're not supposed to be able to change it. Law enforcement should not be able to change it any more than we can change the traffic laws uh, that we are governed by by ourselves. We have to go through the legislative process and they have to go through the amendment process. So essentially all that the original meaning approach to constitutional interpretation means is that the meaning of the Constitution has to stay the same until it's properly changed. And the way you properly change it is with the amendment process.
Right. Um, well, I, I consider myself first and foremost a legal scholar, and um, I've never really considered myself uh, either a litigator or a legal advocate per se. Um, I got drawn into um, litigation on the basis of my scholarship. Um, back in the day when uh, the medical marijuana movement was going on in, in California, there was a lawsuit for, uh, on behalf of the Oakland Can against the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative, or OCBC, um, and the trial judge in that case, Charles Breyer, who's Justice Breyer's brother, asked the parties to brief the Ninth Amendment, which says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And so the lawyers in that case in California went around the country trying to find somebody who knew something about the Ninth Amendment, and that was one of my particular expertise. And so they came to me and I helped them write a few pages of their trial brief and gradually got drawn into that lawsuit, which was a Commerce Clause lawsuit. Um, and that's how one thing led to another. The OCBC case led to the Rache case which we brought uh, so that we'd have better facts to make a Commerce Clause challenge. And then um, all of that experience fed into my scholarship on the original meaning of the Commerce Clause and my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, which came out right about the same time the Rache case was argued. And then after a hiatus, um, in which I thought that Congress would never be able to find a law that would violate uh, or exceed its Commerce Clause powers as interpreted by Rache, Congress managed to do that uh, in the Affordable Care Act case. and so. So, uh, a body of knowledge I developed uh, on the Commerce Clause turned out to be highly relevant to challenging that law. And then that's what's taken me up until today. Well, I think in early on I signed a couple and I've since become convinced by things I've read um, that it's really irresponsible to sign a brief unless you consider yourself a real expert on that subject so that you have an independent opinion on the merits of the argument being made in that brief other than the fact, well, it sounds good to me. And I think most uh, law professors, unfortunately, sign on to briefs because they sound good to them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they really know the field. So I really refrain from signing amicus briefs that I, uh, I'm not expert on and, and usually that I haven't really uh, worked on a lot. I've done quite a few amicus briefs with the Cato Institute and those amicus briefs are rather hands-on. I'm, I'm working with other lawyers, uh, but I'm actually um, you know, quite involved in the crafting of those briefs. And I've also, the same thing is true with the Constitution Accountability Center. So I don't do, I, I tend to agree with the justice about uh, law professors just signing on. It's essentially like signing a petition saying, I like this side. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's not really their expertise that's being brought to bear. Um, it's greatly improved my teaching uh, because it's forced me to approach teaching from a litigation standpoint that I never really had before, just as an academic dealing with theory and ideas. Uh, I now uh, can expressly teach constitutional law the way I used to teach criminal law, and that is as a former litigator in the field, uh, I could tell the students, well, this is what you need to know, and this is what you don't need to know, and this is how the system works, and I can now do that in constitutional law, but I couldn't, when I couldn't do it before. Uh, but this actually is not inconsistent with the way I teach constitutional law. Uh, unlike a lot of con law professors who go into class and get a discussion essentially going on whether you like this side or whether you like that side, and if you like this side, what arguments can you make for it, and if you like that side, what arguments can you make for it, I don't teach constitutional law that way at all. Uh, the way I teach it, and I have a case book that um, is organized this way, um, I teach the narratives that sort of each side of whatever, of sort of whatever constitutional culture we're in believe in, because most of the participants, in fact all the participants, um, uh, in the legal system sort of buy into one of these narratives or the other. And these narratives are, have developed over centuries in front of a court that's been in continuous uh, existence for a couple centuries. Um, and I, my job, I think, um, is to teach the students what these narratives are. Uh, I think other professors end up teaching it, um, but, they don't tr they're not, but they're doing it by studying doctrine after doctrine. And I think it's a lot easier just to say, hey, look, let's start at the beginning. This is what's developed, and this is how this justice considered, this, this is the narrative that this, this, this side of the court is, is, is imagining in their head that they're participating in, and this is the narrative of that side. And essentially, there's an internal logic of each side's um, views, the conservative side at any given time and the progressive or liberal side at any given time, and I try to teach that logic.
and that puts me somewhat outside the material that I'm teaching. I, by the way, disagree with both of these worldviews that I'm teaching. So it makes me a critic, uh, but of both, and not really an advocate, so to speak, of any particular outcome in any particular case. Yeah, well, the reason why my chair is titled Legal Theory, or rather, let's say, Constitutional Law, is I'm a contracts professor and a contract scholar. I have a contracts casebook, and I've done contract law theory since before I did constitutional law theory. Um, and what legal theory really is, it's, it's basically thinking about the, the doctrines um, in a systematic way, and it's also uh, normative. Um, uh, it can be normative, and in this case it is normative, and that is arguing, again, with justice in mind, what ought the doctrine be? What ought the courts be doing in order to see that justice is done? And that's the kind of thing that practitioners generally don't really have time. Uh, it's not really part of their job and they really don't have time to think about systematically and what I, and I certainly didn't when I was a criminal prosecutor. Uh, but as a law professor, I think that's my job, is to figure out what ought to be done, what ought to be the case, and make sound arguments for why that's the case. I mean, in a sense, it makes me an advocate. I mean, I, I'm an advocate in that sense. I advocate the views I do about justice. I advocate the views I do about liberty. Uh, politically, I'm a libertarian. I'm known to be a libertarian. I advocate that. So it's not like I don't advocate things. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm not an advocate in the sense that I'm on this side of a particular case or that side of a particular case um, uh, uh, on a constant basis. Right. Well, I mean, uh, with all due respect to my friend Larry Lessig, who I think is uh, brilliant and who I really admired uh, the work he did in the intellectual property sphere, and I was on his side in that issue, I don't think his brief um, is an actual originalist argument. It, it, it purports to be one. Um, but what originalism is, is a discussion of what the meaning of the words of the text are and how the meaning of the words don't change just because we want to update them and we don't like them, or even when they get in the way of what we want to do. And, and discussing generally sort of what the gestalt was at the, back in the day uh, and what corruption is. I mean, the word corruption doesn't appear <laughs> in the uh, Constitution, and it doesn't really help us much to decide what is in the Constitution. Um, so um, it's kind of a faux originalist argument done by someone who is not himself an originalist. It's not unusual. Um, in both the Second Amendment area and in the Commerce Clause areas, you have lots of legal historians who themselves object to originalism, uh, and yet they sign amicus briefs uh, trying to instruct the court on what the original understanding of this or that was. Uh, the irony here is that one of the objections they have to originalism is that uh, it's too complicated and you really can't do it. Uh, and then they turn around and do it them, purport to do it themselves when they sign amicus briefs telling the court uh, in their expert opinion what the original understanding was. But most of them don't really understand how to practice originalism and therefore their briefs typically miss the mark. They're really not about what an originalist justice ought to, or judge ought to be looking at. I, I actually have an article coming out in the Fordham Law Review uh, on this very subject called The Gravitational Force of Originalism, uh, in which I argue that originalism uh, plays obvious roles um, sometimes, but less obvious behind the scene roles other times. And one of the first things you have to realize to understand why originalism doesn't play into most cases is that originalism is a theory of interpretation. It's a theory about what the words of the text mean. And most of what the court does, 99% of the time, is interpret its own doctrine. And what legal doctrine is, is a way of putting what the text says into effect. And it is, a, it is what originalists or, or constitutional law theorists now call constitutional construction as opposed to constitutional interpretation. So most of what the courts are doing is interpreting their own past precedents. Um, they're not interpreting the meaning of the text itself. And so that's the reason why originalism rarely plays a role. Where the courts are operating with very limited precedent, um, as they did in the Heller case, then you see that both sides of the court are very concerned about what the original meaning of the text is. 
Uh, in the Affordable Care Act challenge, one of the reasons why we actually didn't make an originalist argument at all in that case, but one of the reasons why we had some room to move is because we argued, I think successfully, that this particular uh, law, uh, the individual insurance mandate, was unprecedented. It literally had never been done before, and therefore past precedent didn't really apply. So originalism can apply directly if the court is dealing with the words of the text. Uh, in the McDonald case, uh, interesting that you would raise the McDonald case, because the McDonald case dealt with, a, there was a, a lot of precedent that got in the way of the original meaning of the, of the text. Nevertheless, the fifth vote, the fifth and deciding vote by Justice Thomas was an expressly originalist vote, um, and, it, and, and he did not join the plurality opinion by Justice Alito, which was not um, as originalist, uh, it, it didn't follow the original meaning. But even Justice Alito's uh, plurality opinion in McDonald um, uh, did not contradict the original meaning um, and tried to stay true to it while it was following precedent. Um, and finally, I would say in the Affordable Care Act challenge itself, even though we made no originalist arguments, um, uh, in the Ford, and I made no originalist arguments except in an article in which I point out that this really did violate the original meaning of the Constitution. Um, I think originalism op is operating in the background um, because it, it explains in part the Rehnquist Court's new federalism, which basically said that uh, it was going to accept the precedence of the New Deal, um, and so Congress um, could go this far, um, but it, if it was going to go any farther than that, then it was going to have to offer a special justification, and that justification would not be one uh, that could lead to an unlimited police power in the state. So there had to be a limiting principle on any argument that went farther than where it's previously gone. Now, why would they hold Congress to go this far and no farther? And the answer is that going this far really stretches way beyond the original meaning of the Constitution and so is somewhat illegitimate. It's going to be okay on the basis of precedent, but it's somewhat illegitimate on originalist grounds and therefore if you want to go any farther, you better have special justification that doesn't undermine the whole scheme that's identified by the original meaning of the Constitution. So even in a case where we make no originalist arguments, the doctrine that's being employed by at least five justices um, uh, is influenced. Uh, by the gravitational force, shall we say, of originalism in the background. Um, well, I have to tell you that the um, relationship of precedent to original meaning is controversial amongst scholars who consider themselves to be originalists. So I'm on one side of this issue and other people are on the other side. My own view is that precedent should not be allowed to trump the original meaning of the text and typically doesn't, um, but it has in the past and it should not be allowed to. So any precedent that's inconsistent with the original meaning of the text ought to be reconsidered. Uh, but the other point I was making earlier is that most precedent is not about interpretation at all. It's about putting into effect what the text says. So for example, the text protects the freedom of speech. Um, it doesn't say anything about what the reasonable regulation of speech would look like. So we have a very elaborate doctrine governing the time, place, and manner, for example, of when you can, when you can assemble and when you can speak and how you can speak, so as not to interfere with the liberties of your fellow citizens who are, at the time you're trying to block the road or just trying to get to work. Uh, all of this time, place, and manner doctrine uh, is not in the Constitution, it's not a matter of original meaning, so therefore, and it's a matter of constitutional construction that tries to effectuate what is in the Constitution, the freedom of speech. And when the court is dealing with their own doctrine, precedent plays a very important role in developing that doctrine and causing that, and, 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 and helping them to be consistent, and particularly to give guidance to lower courts who are deciding how to follow the instructions of the, uh, uh, of the Supreme Court. So most of the time, precedent is fine, it's just where it goes against original meaning is where I think um, it ought to be reversed and where other originalists think, well, maybe with the passage of time and the basis of reliance that maybe the precedent can still go on, even if, as I said, uh, in the context of uh, the, new, the, the Rehnquist Court's new federalism, because it violates original meaning, you can't go farther. And what, mainly what the other side, what the non-originalist side or what the, what the left or the progressives basically are saying is, look, we just want to extrapolate a logical line from where we are to where we want to be. And so, you know, once you've established this precedent, then you can just go all the way. And that's really what the Rehnquist court rejected. They basically viewed the New Deal as a high watermark uh, 
rather than a principle that could be extended indefinitely. And if you want to go above that high water mark, you better have a justification that does not undermine the whole system. There was a view on the part of professors who never agreed with the Lopez and Morrison decisions and never agreed with the Rehnquist Court New Federalism, that the Rehnquist Court New Federalism had fizzled out and failed um, and had been abandoned. And there was no, we couldn't be 100% sure they were wrong about that. After all, uh, in the Raich case, which is taken as evidence of the fact that the Rehnquist uh, New Federalism had been uh, uh, run, run its course, um, you had Justice Kennedy and Justice Scalia go over and uphold the application of the Controlled Substance Act to my client, Angel Rage. Um, and then you had, of the three dissenters, Chief Justice Rehnquist was no longer on the court. Justice O'Connor is no longer on the court, leaving only Justice Thomas. And so it might look to an observer as though this was an eight to one situation at best because the Rehnquist court new federalism was, was over. Uh, I always thought this was a misreading of Rage. Um, and a misreading of Justice Kennedy and, and Scalia's views. And then I was only concerned with Justice Robert, Chief Justice Roberts and Alito's views because we really didn't know what they were. Uh, we hadn't really heard from them about this very much when they were lower court judges. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, what the case reveals is that there are still five votes for the Rehnquist Court's approach. Um, it's now the Roberts Court's approach with respect to the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. And we actually uh, clarified and made better law on the Necessary and Proper Clause than we've ever had before. Um, the way the case came out badly, and the reason why the Affordable Care Act was largely but not completely upheld, is because of the constitutional problem that the majority saw with the individual mandate as a mandate, Chief Justice uh, Roberts decided that he could revise that, make it not a mandate at all, but make it an option to purchase health insurance or pay a modest tax, provided the tax remained modest, uh, and under this, what he called a saving construction, which is a change in the text from, a, from, the, mo uh, from the natural, its natural meaning, he could then uphold the rest of the law, having made that change. So in a sense, we objected to the law as written, which is really all you can object to, and he upheld a different law than the one that Congress enacted, and, and that itself poses certain, I think, separation of powers uh, problems. Yeah, well, I mean, um, the separation of powers argument is simply that Congress passed the law it passed, and the court is upholding a different law than Congress passed, so that the law that got upheld is never one that was voted on by Congress. So that's the separation of powers argument. Um, I think the issue is whether you like the Constitution or you don't. I happen to like the Constitution, as amended. Uh, and therefore, I would like to see it enforced, all of it, including the parts that conservatives don't want to see enforced, like the Ninth Amendment I mentioned above, um, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. That, that was an, at issue in the McDonald case. That's a part of the Constitution that was part of the 14th Amendment was considered to be central to it, and yet it has disappeared because of the Supreme Court's misinterpretation of that, and now it's sticking with its precedent. So. Um, to the extent I advocate anything as a constitutional lawyer uh, or as a law professor, I advocate uh, for um, uh, sticking with the Constitution, the whole Constitution, even the parts that get in the way of what you might want to do because, in fact, the other parts uh, might, you might value. And we should really uh, either like, we should either follow the whole Constitution or we should change it. Um, and I think part of the reason why, and this is not a thought that's unique to me, part of the reason why it, uh, it, it doesn't get changed as much as it used to is because if the Supreme Court is going to do all the changing, it's an easier way to do it than actually having to muster the political will to change it through the amendment process. The, the Supreme Court did not do its job. Um, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I think if you study the history of the Supreme Court, it's mostly a history of the Supreme Court not doing its job. Um, that's why when I te my casebook, which is very Supreme Court focused, is certainly not, uh, does not always show the Supreme Court in a good light. It's one case after another in which the Supreme Court abrogates its responsibilities. And typically what it's doing is it's failing to say no 
to the legislature, to Congress. It's failing to say no to the executive branch. Um, but it's primarily failing to say no to Congress, uh, partly because what Congress is doing is popular and the Supreme Court tends not to deviate too far from what popular opinion is at any given time. Um, and so when, for example, the North withdrew from the South and gave up on Reconstruction um, and essentially let the Southerners uh, do what they wanted with uh, the freemen that were, th that were there after the Civil War, uh, the Supreme Court didn't get in the way. In fact, they pulled back, you know, they, they pulled back their doctrines just the way the Northern uh, uh, armies got pulled back. Uh, I don't think this is, was the Supreme Court's finest hour, and, but it is typical. Of, uh, of what the Supreme Court has done in the crunch. Um, and so this is another example was where crunch time came. You can't really count on the court uh, to do the right thing or to, by following the Constitution where it looks like it might create a political problem for the court. I don't know that I have a good explanation of what accounts for the failure. I do think the court tends to uh, want to preserve what it thinks of as its legitimacy by not straying too far from what popular opinion uh, might be on a given topic. Um, I think individual justices are, in, are influenced by the peer groups that, whose opinion and respect that they want to garner. And I think we're all like that. I'm certainly like that. Uh, I think it's a human uh, trait uh, to, want to be, want to get the respect of the people whose opinion you respect. And, uh, and as a result, one uh, sometimes shapes one's uh, behavior accordingly. It should look to the Constitution and it should question any of its own doctrines that seem to be uh, uh, trying to get around the Constitution. I mean we have the, the name of my book is called Restoring the Lost Constitution, and I'm not interested in restoring a lost constitutional law from some bygone era. Any bygone era you point me to, I can point you to all the injustices that were taking place in that particular era. Um, it's talking about restoring the clauses of the Constitution that are now gone. And ask any litigator, any constitutional litigator uh, who's watching this video, um, ask them, um, whether they can go into court and litigate the Ninth Amendment, can they litigate the Privileges or Immunities Clause, can they litigate the Origination Clause that says revenue bills must originate in the House, uh, can they um, litigate the Contracts Clause in any but a, a, a small number of areas, until recently could they litigate the Second Amendment, no, could they really litigate the Commerce Clause, the Necessary Proper Clause, well yeah, but only if Congress does something way, way out. Um, uh, as a result of the Rehnquist Court, but prior to, uh, uh, you know, 1995, not that either. And so one clause, and I, and I haven't even got to most of them, uh, one clause after another of the Constitution has been interpreted by the Supreme Court out of existence. That's the reason why I became a contracts professor, because when I took constitutional law from Larry Tribe, who was, my, uh, who was a brilliant teacher, um, um, basically when I read what the Supreme Court had done to all what I considered to be the good parts of the Constitution, I decided if the Supreme Court isn't going to take the Constitution seriously, then why should I? And when I became a law professor, I became a contracts professor where writings, contracts are taken more seriously, um, and as is the doctrine uh, taken more seriously. So for that reason, um, uh, it's only been since I became a law professor later on that I was able to decide that after I had tenure it would be okay for me to say that the parts of the Constitution that lawyers can't litigate ought to be uh, brought back and made the law of the land. So I think if the Supreme Court actually followed all the Constitution, we, it would be a lot better off and we would be a lot better off. The Constitution is designed to get in the way of what legislatures do. It's designed to facilitate what they do uh, because it's not, it's seeking to empower a government, but it's also seeking to restrict that government. And those restrictions can get in the way of what popular majorities want to do and even what special interest minorities want to do and they ha when they have the clout in the legislative uh, uh, pr uh, process. Um, so the Constitution is designed to get in the way. And, but when something is popular and when something gets enacted, the Supreme Court based on its, in, its culture and where the justices tend to come from, the Supreme Court is reticent uh, to actually stand in the way of what most people want to see done. Most people are reticent to stand in the way of what most people want to see done. Uh, I don't like 
expressing you know strong minority views I like to go along I like to express views that I think my that my audience is going to agree with uh, and because I think that's human nature what they've tended to do over time is take the parts of the Constitution that have gotten in the way and they've interpreted them out of existence and then they rely on their precedent which have done that from then on in so that those parts of the Constitution have been lost and they are no longer operative now my my colleagues on the left think that's a good idea because many of them actually don't like the original constitution and that's the reason why they're down on the original constitution and and start you know using ep, uh, um, ad hominems or I guess you can't do an ad hominem against the text but they do ad hominems against the people who wrote it you know that's when we hear so much about how they were it was written by slaveholders and it was written by white males and this is a way of delegitimating the text of the constitution that's why they're saying these things because they don't like what they say because what it says gets in the way way of what they want to see done. Uh, it's not true that the Constitution is consistent with every public policy. It's not true. Um, and, that's, and if it were true, you wouldn't have to eliminate the clauses that got in the way. And I think every lawyer out there listening to me knows that they can't litigate certain clauses because they're gone. How do you get to be a Supreme Court justice? I mean, who gets to be a Supreme Court justice? You, get to, you have to be someone who's nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by an elected Senate. Um, this tends to limit appointments to people who um, are what we might call mainstream folks. They're people who travel in the circles that all the other people would travel in who would get to that path. Um, and um, they tend to think conventionally, which is kind of how the system is set up. I'm that, you know, if I'm going to say I like the Constitution, I have to, or, or I think we ought to follow the Constitution, I think we ought to follow the Constitution that says the President gets to nominate and the Senate gets to confirm, that has certain consequences. Not all of them are good. You end up having a relatively mainstream Supreme Court um, uh, even though there are divides, and there's no question there's a left and a right side of the court that's a relatively mainstream Supreme Court that basically all share in common the view that they, they don't want to get in the way too much of what the public at any given time uh, thinks is necessary and proper. I think this is a very understandable uh, view to have. It's just the problem is that, uh, that over a 200 year period of time uh, when some issue comes before the court and then the court buckles uh, with respect to that issue and modifies its doctrine so as to get around the text of the Constitution. With our system of precedent, that tends to stick and it's difficult to go back and revive the original text of the Constitution so that it does the work it was designed to do. The Constitution is sort of an integrated machine, it's, or put it this way, the Constitution is like an airplane. Um, that uh, has redundant systems built into it in order to prevent a crash. Um, and what happens, you eliminate one engine on a four-engine jet, you can still fly pretty well. You eliminate two engines, well, now, not so, now, but you eliminate three engines, you can still fly, but you're not flying in the same way you did before. You're not flying quite as well. By eliminating one part of this integrated document after another, we are left with stuff that has kept us one of the freest countries in the world. Um, but we are doing it on redundant backup systems. The Bill of Rights, for example, was a backup system. It wasn't the original system. It wasn't there for two years. It only got added as a redundant safety mechanism because some people did not want to get on the boat, to change my metaphor from airplanes to boats. They did not want to get on the boat without life, uh, without a life uh, uh, boats on the boat. Um, and so they, we said, they said, fine, James Madison said, you know, we need to get these people on. We only have 11 states in. We want to get the other two in. And we're going to, prom and we're going to get, we're deliver on our promise and give them amendments and we're going to give them these rights and then hopefully they'll trust us and they'll get on the boat. These were not considered the primary constraints on government. They were the backup uh, safety mechanisms, the lifeboats that were put on the, gov uh, 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 on the boat in, in case the rest of the structure of the boat would fail. Um, and we've been operating on these backup systems for quite a long time. They've been relatively good, better than not having them at all, um, but not as good as having the entire structure of the ship um, uh, operating as designed. I'm saying the Bill of Rights did not exist 
it, first of all, it wasn't called the Bill of Rights for quite a number of years. It was the amendments to the Constitution. And it did not exist for two years. For two years, we had a Constitution, the structure of which did not include an express Bill of Rights. Um, but the people were very skeptical of this. They said, we don't trust this boat. We don't trust the structure that you've designed. And we need lifeboats. And the Bill of Rights are a backup lifeboat situation. But I'll tell you, if you're on an ocean and your boat goes down and you're in the lifeboats, you're not in your first best situation. It would be better to be on the ship than it is to be on the lifeboats. And the Bill of Rights is our backup, redundant safety mechanism in order to protect us when the structure is not working. That's what they're there for. They're there to protect us when the structure doesn't work as it's supposed to. And because various elements of the structure have been eliminated one after the other, um, we're left to rely on a Bill of Rights. The problem with the Bill of Rights, getting back to the Ninth Amendment, is it's radically incomplete. You know, it, it, it's, it's eight amendments. Um, and it only covered a certain number of things, the things that were of most concern at the time. It doesn't protect all the liberties of the people, uh, and the Ninth Amendment is there to remind people uh, that it doesn't protect, that, it, it, that these are not all the liberties that the people have. Um, so the Bill of Rights, if you're going to limit, and, and as you mentioned footnote four earlier, footnote four is supposed to be limiting the judicial power to the express prohibitions of the Constitution. It's not what the court has ever actually done, but that's the theory of it. Well, the express prohibitions are few and far between uh, because there have been sort of general, what you might call a savings clause for the rest of the liberties, which are the Ninth Amendment uh, with respect to the federal government and the Privileges or Immunities Clause with respect to the states. But both of those clauses have been rendered inoperative by the Supreme Court with the consent of both the left and the right of the political spectrum. Elements of the left and elements of the right part side of the court are in agreement that they don't want to revive the Ninth Amendment and the Privileges or Immunities Clause as evidenced by the McDonald uh, decision in which only one justice was prepared to revive the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And why? It wasn't because they didn't know what the Privileges or Immunities Clause meant. It's because they did know what it meant and they didn't want to go there. The, con the conservative side of the court wanted to stick to substantive due process, even though they claim not to like it very much, because I think they think they've got substantive due process in a box uh, where it doesn't work very much. And it doesn't work very much if you follow the Glucksburg line of cases, for example. You'll never recognize another unenumerated right again, and they're pretty happy with that situation. Um, it was clear in oral argument, and I was there for oral argument, that the, that uh, that none of the justices, except for Justice Thomas, who doesn't ask questions, um, uh, was prepared to consider uh, uh, the unenumerated rights that the, those who wrote uh, the 14th Amendment had in mind and which are reflected in the original public meaning of the term privileges or immunities. And you have Justice Alito, for example, in uh, rebuttal asking Ellen Gura whether the, among the privileges or immunities does that include the right of contract? Uh, well, this was, a, this was a, not a trick question, but it was a, a loaded question because A, it's obvious that the Privilege and Immunities Clause did include the right of contract because the right of contract was specifically mentioned in the Civil Rights Act of 1866 to which the Privileges or Immunities Clause refers and, and it was the reason why the 14th Amendment was enacted was essentially to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866 which protects the right of contract. However, we also know based on the Supreme Court's precedent that the protection of the right of the liberty of contract is considered a no-go a zone. It's a, it's a, you're not supposed to do that. The Lochner case, which protected the liberty of contract, is, an, is part of the anti-canon. It's, the the, it's part of the cases that, that if your argument leads to that outcome, then your argument must be wrong. And so there's an example of where the right side of the court uh, did not want to go to the Privilege of Immunities Clause. And as Justice Scalia said in oral argument, he's resigned himself to, he's acquiesced to um, uh, the, using substantive due process instead. Um, well, I don't think it's up to the justices to acquiesce. That gets us back to our discussion of precedent. I don't think the justices get to acquiesce uh, to, uh, a, uh, to not enforce the Constitution. Um, uh, where it's actually, where, where its meaning is de determinable. And the left side of the court has other concerns um, with protecting liberty across the board. They might want to protect certain liberties, but they don't want to protect other liberties, including, for example, economic liberty. Uh, and you'll notice, if you're talking about what's in the Constitution, what's not in the Constitution, there's no distinction in the Constitution between economic liberty 
and non-economic liberty. In fact, the Constitution speaks of life, liberty, and property, and property by modern rubric is considered to be economic in nature. Uh, but that is something the court has hewed to, that is a distinction the court has hewed to, um, you know, for 50 years, 60 years. Uh, judicial activism was a pejorative term coined by Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in the 1940s to, con to criticize some of the New Deal justices who started to protect rights uh, that were not specifically enumerated in the Constitution. Um, and he accused them of activism. It was a charge that had been invented to uh, delegitimate uh, the concept of judicial negation of legislation, uh, judicial invalidation of legislation, because ostensibly the argument goes that an unelected, unaccountable judiciary is standing in the way and thwarting what Theodore Roosevelt called the popular will or the will of the people. Um, and they should not be allowed to do that. Um, and Theodore Roosevelt made that argument when he was running for president as a progressive in 1912. Uh, so, um, that's, when that's where judicial activism came from. It's a way of getting the court not to do its duty. Um, uh, pretty much everybody who's listening to this video believes that the court ought to follow the Constitution, ought to invalidate laws that violate the Constitution. Um, if invalidating a law itself is activism, everybody who's listening to this video believes in activism. That shows you that activism is an empty phrase that doesn't really tell you what you want to know, and that is when should the court invalidate legislation and when should it not? Um, and, and everybody agrees you should do it. So I, you know, I'm one of those who favor judicial engagement as opposed to either activism or restraint. Judicial engagement is judicial restraint. It's basically, the judges should be restrained by the meaning of the Constitution. So even where they don't want to strike down a law because it's popular, they should strike down the law because the Constitution, it's contrary to the Constitu what the Constitution says. Um, and so, um, uh, the whole activism trope is one that, as, as, as you mentioned, the, you know, Justice Ginsburg sees, thinks the court is activist. Why? Why does she think that, even though, as Adam Liptak points out, it doesn't strike down very many laws? Because it's striking down some of the laws that she thinks should be upheld. And she doesn't have any problem voting for uh, striking, invalidating laws she thinks are unconstitutional, and she shouldn't have any problem with that. Um, and so activism is solely in the eye of the beholder and is not a very helpful concept. I mean, part, part of the problem we have today, we have a lot of problems today with the way we think of the Constitution. One of the problems we have is that we think of the power of judicial review, and then we try to justify that. That's a modern concept, the power of judicial review. At the time of the founding, no one spoke of the power of judicial review. They spoke of a duty of judges to follow the law, the duty of judges to follow the Constitution, and if the Constitution uh, says that a particular act of legislation is, 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 is not proper, it's not allowed, then the duty of the judges is to follow the higher law. Now why change the rhetoric from the concept of the duty, the judicial duty, to the idea of a power of judicial review? Because power should be exercised with discretion. Powers um, should be exercised with restraint. We, we all have powers, but we should be discreet about how we exercise them, and we should be restrained. Um, we don't think of duties that way. We don't think, well, you should be, you know, you should exercise your, you should, you should comply with your duties with discretion, or you should be restrained in adhering to your duties. No, if you have a duty to take care of your children, you don't do that with discretion. You, you fulfill your complete and total duty to your children. Um, and so the move from duty to power was a way of delegitimating the power or the ability uh, or the right um, of the third branch of government, the, the judicial branch of government, to have to agree that a measure is constitutional before that measure becomes law. So if Congress thinks a measure is unconstitutional, they never pass it. The Supreme Court never gets to um, uh, pass upon it. If the president thinks a measure is unconstitutional, he can veto it. But for a measure to be found to be constitutional, all three branches, including the judiciary, must concur that it's constitutional. That is not a power to interfere with the other two branches. That is, a, that is the way the system is designed so that you have this redundant backup, this redundant safety mechanism that you have, to, you have to satisfy all three branches before the law gets imposed on the sovereign people.
Um, and if the courts are basically going to defer to the legislature, then they're not doing their job. Let me just bring up one additional problem with the way we currently think of things, the way constitutional law is currently done. And it's the problem that I call double deference, the problem of double deference. You have the court having a whole series of doctrines that say we defer to the legislature, otherwise we'd be activists. We defer to the legislature's judgment about whether something is within their constitutional power. All right, now you just go across the street and you ask the congressmen and the senators whether what they're doing is constitutional and what answer will you get from them? The answer you get from them is it's constitutional because the courts will uphold us. Oh, wait a second. The courts are upholding them because they're deferring to Congress's judgment. You ask Congress about its judgment of constitutionality, it says, what we're doing is constitutional is because, look over there, the courts are upholding us. And if, uh, according to this way of looking at things, no one ever looks at the Constitution. Independently, each side is looking at the other side and the Constitution drops out. This is a game that's played so that the Congress and so can do what it wants, um, and so that and so the so-called popular will can prevail. The Constitution is there to constrain that in order to protect the rights of all the people, not just a majority and not just a well-connected minority, but all the people, including those people who don't have the political clout um, uh, to prevail in the legislature, including those people who don't have the political clout to prevail in the court, because they haven't been recognized yet as a legitimate aggrieved group. They are that far out. Um, so before you ever get protected by the court, you have to be sufficiently politically influential before the court's prepared to protect you. Well, not I wouldn't say it's mistaken muscle. I would say in some respect it's correct muscle. Uh, I, you have a country that's very closely divided. Um, we're either a 50-50 country or we're a 40-40 country with 20 in the middle. Uh, but we're a very closely divided country and given the way our constitutional order is set up, uh, that means uh, we have divided government and when we have divided government it's difficult to quote get things done. That's the way it's supposed to be. Difficult to get things done if there's divided government and when the Republicans took the House after the Affordable Care Act was uh, rammed through um, the House and Senate, um, they have a responsibility to their constituents to represent the views that, according to the theory of representative government, um, they're supposed to represent the views of their constituents which are contrary to the views of the majority uh, who are currently in the Senate and, a, and, the, and, the pres and the person who holds the office of president. I do think, in answer to your question, that when the country is that divided, it does give the Supreme Court more room to move because there is sort of, there's no popular overwhelming sentiment for one thing as opposed to other. When there was a popular overwhelming sentiment to um, protect us from Japanese invasion and that required in the, in, in the opinion of the executive branch the internment of American citizens of Japanese ancestry, the court was not going to get in the way of that because there was an overwhelming popular sense that this had to be done and the court was just not going to stand in the way of that. When there was this popular sense that the North uh, was going to have to, uh, uh, the federal government was, not, was going to have to have a hands-off policy towards Jim Crow and segregation in the South, the court was not going to get in the way of that. They just weren't. Here, when we have a much more closely divided government, you have each side of the court more prepared to essentially uh, uh, take the positions that they think are constitutionally required because they're not bucking an overwhelming majority on the other side. Um, and so when you have a more evenly divided country, you can have a more evenly divided court, um, and that's what we have. The mistaken muscle is, is actually not a good metaphor because what the court's doing that's improper is standing aside and letting the other branches do what they want. It, it's, it's rarely doing the wrong thing when it says no. It's almost, it, it, where it does the wrong thing is when it said yes. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not saying it never does the wrong thing when it says no, but that's a very, very small percentage of the mistakes that it's made. Most of the mistakes that have been made have been errors of omission, not errors of commission. Um, and so in that sense, they're not using their muscles. Um, uh, they may have good reason for that. There may be institutional reasons for that, um, but I think the safest course of action for all is just to follow the Constitution, where the Constitution uh, says what it does, uh, and not to come up with doctrines that will eliminate whole sections of the Constitution. So that's where I think safety lies.
It's a great question. It's a really um, important topic that I'm glad we finally got to. As I already explained, to get on the Supreme Court, the President must nominate you, he's elected. Senate must confirm you, they're elected. Um, and that means that ultimately the direction that the court takes is going to be uh, influenced by politics. And so what that requires is uh, political entrepreneurs to start making the Constitution an issue in politics so that people that get elected to the Senate and a president that, get, that runs for president, a, a person that runs for president is running in part on a plank of following the Constitution. Uh, it's got to be the way our system is set up, for better or for worse, it's got to come through the political process before it's going to get on the court before it's going to reach the court. That's just the only way it can be done in our system. You can't argue the justices into doing something the justices don't want to do. Believe me, I've tried it. It doesn't work. Um, and Alan Gura tried it. It didn't work. Uh, and so um, uh, that's just not the way it's going to happen. It's going to happen by this pol long-run political process. It's exactly what I think the Tea Party is trying to accomplish. You may like them, you may hate them, but they're, they're, the one word that you'll hear most often from uh, the Tea Party is the word constitution, or two words, the constitution. Um, and they've made this part of their uh, political platform to restore the constitution. You may think they have a misguided view of what the constitution is, but the way you effectuate change at the highest levels is by doing it this way. It's what the progressives did very, very effectively. Uh, when they eventually, after a period of decades, got the composition of the court to reflect their views of this kind of hands-off approach towards the legislature uh, that Teddy Roosevelt was arguing for in 1912, but it didn't really fully come to fruition until Herbert Hoover was president and he nominated some, pro uh, some uh, progressive uh, justices that began the movement in the early 30s, before Franklin Roosevelt even was elected president. Um, and so... Um, that's the way it's always been done, and it's the way it has to be done. It's not going to be done um, by writing clever law review articles uh, that will persuade five justices to do something that they know goes against the basic narrative of what they believe uh, to be uh, what they think of as mainstream constitutionalism. Right. Assuming that the political process is allowed to operate and, for example, the Internal Revenue Service isn't, uh, isn't sicked on the groups that are advocating a, restoral of the, a rest restoration of the Constitution. Uh, I mean, the political process can be gamed. I mean, I come from Chicago. I grew up with that system. I know what that system is like. I was a Cook County State's Attorney pra practicing law in front of the Circuit Court of Cook County. I understand what that system can be like. Um, and. Um, as long as the system is allowed to operate, that's how it's supposed to work. It doesn't always, it's not always allowed to operate that way. Uh, it's not clear uh, uh, exactly you know, what was happening in the 2012 election with the suppression of, uh, of, of the opposition uh, to the current, um, um, to, the, to the reigning uh, ideology with respect to the Constitution. Uh, but look, we'd have, we have to move forward and uh, hopefully those sorts of things won't happen again and the political process will be allowed to work. Well, uh, that's a difficult question. I mean, I think the, that the Constitution is not consistent with all political outcomes or all policies. It's, it's inconsistent with some and consistent with others. But there's an awful lot in the, in the original Constitution that progressives uh, like and should like, um, and that maybe some conservatives won't like. I mean, I find that, uh, I think, you know, you may have even detected it from some of the other things I've said, that I see conservatives, I'm not talking about justices at the moment, I'm just talking about uh, people who advocate in the, in the realm of ideas. There are conservatives who don't like parts of the Constitution because they don't like the implications of those parts of the Constitution. Uh, and just as there are, are those on the left who feel that way. So I think if you stick to the Constitution, you're actually not going to get political results that completely uh, resonate with one side or as opposed to the other. I actually think that you're going to get results that resonate with both sides, and then you're going to get results that neither side likes. Um, but until you change the Constitution, I think that's the way that the government uh, uh, should be structured. Uh, in other words, I think the Constitution is the law that governs those who govern us. We need to 
those who govern us to be subject to the law and the only way that works is if they follow the law that they are supposed to be that are that it applies to them the way we are expected to follow the law that applies to us well i've only done it once um, i don't really aspire to do it again I'm glad I did it once. I was also in a science fiction movie once. I don't necessarily have to be in that again either. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and it was a, an amazing experience. I have to say I was more uh, anxious, uh, if not fearful, for a longer period of time than I have been in my entire life. For like a six week period of time, I just had this pit in, the, in, the, in my stomach that I was going to be doing this. The day of the argument, I didn't feel that way, which was really remarkable to me after having lived with this, this uh, adrenaline. For, for six weeks, I felt you know, like I used to feel when I was in trying a jury trial. Not normal, I would say, but sort of wired and ready to go. And I think that uh, um, I was, after I, after I kind of, uh, my, my voice caught on the first second, uh, or second sentence that I said, which I sort of identified with Attorney General Varelli's uh, uh, difficulties that day, uh, I had a similar problem. Uh, but then I think once they started hitting me uh, with questions, um, I was able to respond, which is why they hit me harder. I think if you can't respond, they go easy on you. If you can respond, they keep hitting you harder. And it turns out that for accidental reasons, the only justices who asked me questions that day were the ones that voted against our position. Um, and anyone who's argued in front of the court knows that you really are looking for those little life preservers you get thrown by the justices who are on your side well counsel couldn't you really say this and but the three votes that we got in the rage case uh, was chief justice Rehnquist, who was seriously ill and was not in court that day justice o'connor who asked some really tough questions of uh, of paul clement who is the uh, acting solicitor general at the time um, and justice thomas who doesn't ask questions and so i got no help from the justices who ultimately voted on our for our side and i just I took it uh, uh, pretty hard from the justices who were on the other side, but I've listened to that oral argument. I, 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 sign it, I sometimes play it for my students, and I have to say they were very um, uh, gracious to me. They were very polite to me. They were tough, but they were always respectful, um, and uh, I have no complaints about how I was treated by the court at all. Um, I'm, I'm just glad I was able to stand up to what was really pretty, a pretty tough day to be an advocate in front of them. Yeah, during the argument, it was quite apparent to me, you know, you, sit, you stand very close to the justices, and so you really have a sense of their body language and their facial expressions, even in a way that if you're sitting in the bar section, you don't quite see as much, and certainly not if you sit in the gallery. Um, and I really could tell that Justice Kennedy was not with us. Um, he was really, unusually for him actually, somewhat visibly hostile to our side. Um, I don't know why exactly uh, that was true, but I've sensed it at the time. And uh, Justice Scalia, who also, whose vote we needed and who, who we lost, um, he actually was not as tough. Uh, he, his questions were the hardest questions I, I got and the ones I had the most difficult time answering, but he wasn't viscerally um, as uh, antagonistic or, or uh, uh, hostile to our side as he sometimes can be. Uh, he wasn't dismissive in any way. So, he so we could hope that we might have retained his vote. Uh, and maybe at that time he hadn't fully made up his mind, but Justice Kennedy didn't look good, and so I walked out of there not very optimistic. You know, the, the opinion doesn't come down for months later, so by that time I could talk myself into the possibility that, oh, wait a second, maybe we got everybody after all. But on the day, during, while it was happening, it didn't look like it was happening. Yeah, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's true. I, I do think I felt that I kept, my answers kept getting interrupted. And if you don't get your answer out in one sentence, you can't, you're not going to get two sentences it, it, on a, on a, with a hot bench, with a bench that's really arguing with each other about things. And so um, it was frustrating. I did feel that frustration. I've listened to the oral argument. As I say, I didn't, I didn't listen to it for quite a while because it was kind of painful, frankly, to, 
try to think about listening to it. But then because I was teaching, I, I played it for my students. It's not as painful anymore. It's a little bit painful. Um, but that's probably because I know the outcome. If, I, if we won the case, it probably be, I'd be fine with it. But the truth is, I think I got my argument out. I do think it got out. Um, and um, so I think I made the argument. And so one way or the other, even though I was being interrupted, I was able to get it out anyway. And I think that's your job as an advocate uh, is even when you're being interrupted, you've got to get it out. I think I did get it out. They, they disagreed with the argument. It's not because they didn't hear the argument. It's because they didn't agree with it. Well, um, sort of the secret here is that three weeks before oral argument, when I was doing a moot court at the Georgetown Law Center, before I was on the faculty there, um, uh, we discovered a big hole in our argument that would have been a disaster if we hadn't somewhat modified our position. Um, basically, to simplify it without going into the details of what it was legally, you know, there's always concern about the slippery slope questions, and I always knew that this was an issue going, you know, in the case I'd been writing the briefs for two years, and um, I thought I had an answer to the slippery slope question, and then when, during this moot court, the first moot court, um, it turns out my answer did not work, and I could not get off the slippery slope, and, which would have been a disaster. And so ultimately, uh, I had to modify our argument from the brief, even though if I had been asked about that, I would have been able to explain why I wasn't really modifying it from the brief. But I went through two more moot courts in which I practiced. In the next moot court, they didn't ask me the right questions, so I didn't get to practice it. My final moot court, six days before argument, was at the Harvard Law School. They did ask me the right series of questions. I tried out my new answer, did not execute it that well, but it still got me off the slippery slope. So on the day of the argument, um, I was prepared to be a lot clearer, and the reason why I needed to be clearer is because it wasn't quite what we were arguing in our brief, and therefore it was likely to confuse the justices because they're going to expect me to say one thing and I'm saying something else. So I was really clear, and I had a wonderful exchange with Justice Ginsburg on this issue, and she asked me some, a beautiful setup question and a, even a f more fantastic follow-up question. I will always be indebted to her for this. And I got the view out. and. I think it changed the whole dynamics of the argument because at that point we're now all arguing about something that isn't quite in the brief. We're all on the same boat in that respect. Uh, but and and then and the and Justice Breyer took strong issue with what I was saying. However, we were off the slippery slope, and therefore um, uh, I had survived. If it hadn't been for that alteration in our view and on our position, um, I would have been destroyed in the first five or ten minutes, and then it would have been it would have been pitiful. This is, you know, who, who, who listens to SCOTUS blog if not Supreme Court uh, lawyers? So um, I'll give you my, my opinion about that. They're extremely smart. They're extremely good. Uh, most of the time you want to hire one of those guys uh, as opposed to somebody who hasn't been there before. And the most important reason is that, you know, they know the justices. They, they can interpret what the justices' questions, where they're coming from. What you really want to do is you want to answer the justice. You don't want to debate with a justice. You want to answer the justice. If you can, you want to satisfy the justice, or at least you want to give the other justices the right argument to use against that justice. So you really need to know what you're doing. Um, and the Supreme Court bar does. And that's the reason why they're good. However, there is a problem sometimes, and that is they are repeat players, meaning they have a very strong stake in their own reputation in front of the court. And that makes them mainstream in the sense that they may not want to argue or make what they consider to be a deviant argument or an argument that would undermine their long-term credibility with the justices who they must maintain this relationship with in which they're kind of selling their rapport to their clients. Um, that means when a case comes in that is, uh, requires um, a different kind of argument than they feel is respectable, they're not likely to want to make it. They're going to want to trail off uh, and maybe not do that. And I think the cases that the case I was involved with in the Rach case, making the Commerce Clause argument that we were arguing, uh, there are many Supreme Court advocates who just would not feel super comfortable making it. And truthfully, if they made that argument, everyone in the room would know they didn't really believe it. At some point, it's useful, it's helpful for an advocate to get up in front of the court who actually believes the words that are coming out of their mouth and um, 
and has thought about it. And I had the benefit of having a reputation as an academic who had worked in the Commerce Clause area and knew that stuff. And so it put me in a somewhat different position than your average practitioner who's never been in front of the court before because first of all I've studied the justices so I know where they're coming from and so I'm not oblivious to that but secondarily it was quite clear that I believed what I was saying and I understood the position I, I was taking and it was because of that understanding of that position that I was able to modify our argument and save us from disaster when I think many advocates, I won't say all, but I would say many advocates would just feel uncomfortable moving away from their brief three weeks before oral argument in front of the Supreme Court. God, you know, it's so funny. I was about to say that. I, it's amazing that you intuited that was the next thing on my mind, which is that when you're a prosecutor, you make seat of your pants judgments up in front of everybody, the jury's watching you, the judge is watching you, and, you and you're doing things, and you're doing things on the spot, and you're changing your position, and you're responding to things on the spot. And I think it was that experience that gave me the, as a lawyer, that gave me the confidence uh, to say, we're in trouble. This argument does not work. We must make a change. It doesn't matter, and, and, and it's hopefully to a better position, but we can't afford to, we can't stick with what we've got. We've got to do something else. And I was able to do that, I think, in part. I was able to make that move in part because of my, my prosecution background, I have to say. You're, you're asking me a question that I don't really have a pat answer to. Um, uh, I went to Harvard and I hold the views I hold, which I've already stressed, um, uh, are not the same uh, as what all the, just, the views all the justices hold about the uh, law. And I know a lot of people who went to Harvard and Yale who would agree with me and there's people who agree with them. So I don't think that's the problem. Um, uh, I think that it isn't where they're drawn from. I mean, when people say, when people complain about this, they say, well, there hasn't been, there used to be governors and former senators and politics. We don't need that. I mean, that doesn't strike, you know, people who would understand politics. I don't think we need more people on the court that understand politics. I don't, I don't think that's what's missing. Um, the problem is, if there is a problem, it's what it's the narratives that these justices, that the particular people who become justices subscribe to. And this is true generally. This is, this, there's a left side of this narrative. There's a right side of this narrative. It's not limited to people who are on the Supreme Court. It's part of the legal culture that I exist in. Um, it's part of the more public intellectual uh, uh, culture of left and right that I also exist in as a blogger and as somebody who writes op-eds and who gives uh, a lot of talks around the country. Um, I'm bumping heads with conservatives just as I'm bumping heads with progressives. Um, this is just the way it is. And, and so the only way to ultimately address that is to prevail in the realm of ideas and eventually to prevail in the, in the political realm, assuming the polit political realm is allowed to operate. Um, and then, through the process we discussed earlier, will the views respect, uh, reflected in, by the president and by the Senate and then by the court change in the way that I would like to see them change. They're not going to change really much before that. Um, although I do think it's true that to some degree the court, the justices will somewhat follow the election returns in the sense that if there is a big tidal wave of popular sentiment in one direction, they tend to follow that. And if that direction were, were to favor me, they would tend to follow that too. Um, and so I think that could happen really quicker than replacing the whole court. But I don't think the problem um, is the insularity problem that I've heard others complain about. Um, I think, um, look, I think we have an extremely talented Supreme Court. It's not always been the case, I think, that Supreme Court justices have been as smart and as capable and as hardworking and as articulate as the justices are today. Boy, I don't think you can fault this Supreme Court for lack of ability. That's not in any way, shape, or form. Um, uh, I just disagree with some of the judicial stances that they take for, about the Constitution, but I certainly uh, don't criticize uh, their training and their expertise.
it, it's ultimately political. I mean, this is what law professors have called popular constitutionalism. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to this popular constitutionalism business. And that, but it's not because I believe, as I think some want to suggest, that the actual meaning of the Constitution changes with the politics. What changes is Supreme Court doctrine, or what you might call constitutional law. So maybe let's explain it this way. You've got the Constitution over here. The meaning of that does not change according to politics. You have constitutional law over here, some of which is based on interpretation, but most of which is constitutional construction. This is a function of politics, popular constitutionalism, you might say. It does evolve. It is alive. It's living constitutionalism is over here, where constitutional law is being done. It's the Constitution over here that shouldn't be changed or ignored. Um, and so ultimately, uh, it's what's going to happen in our system, the way our system has been set up, is it's going to be political. Right. So, I mean, but to, to say something um, is ultimately, to say that the direction of the court is ultimately going to be dictated by politics is not to say uh, that it has nothing to do with justice, what we talked about at the beginning of this interview, and, or, or principle. Um, to say that, to, to, to imply that it does means politics is nothing but interest group preferences. You know, I want this, I vote for this, you want that, you vote for this. But that's not what politics has to be. It can be that way. In fact, the legislative process oftentimes is that way. It can also be a matter of principle. Um, and you have uh, what you might call conviction politicians. Um, and uh, you've always had them in our history. And you have conviction political actors. Uh, Martin Luther King comes to mind, just the first one that comes to mind. Uh, but another guy who I, I've been doing a lot of work on lately is Chief Justice Salmon Chase, who is you know, always accused of being politically ambitious, but he was a conviction politician whose number one mission was the abolition of slavery in the United States. And he, everything he did was connected up to that principle, uh, uh, even though he was also pursuing his own personal ambitions at the same time. So these two things are not incompatible. You can both have a political system, but that system uh, can be moved by big principles, by appeals to justice, not just appeals to interest. Um, and that's what I think is necessary, I think, for the politics to take the direction I would like to see it go. And that's, how I, that's what I see the connection is between uh, principles in the abstract, the rights of, that, that are retained by the people, um, and the political process that's necessary uh, the way we have it set up, um, the political process that you have to operate within in order to get uh, justice um, uh, for everyone. Oh yeah, well it's not, it's, not, it, it's not part of the political process, it's insulated from, and by political process we mean partisan Democrat-Republican process. It's, it's insulated more or less from that. But going back to what I said before, look, the justices are human beings. They are not gods, they are human beings, which means they're going to be, in, and, and I'm a human being. I'm influenced by the culture around me. I'm influenced by who's up and who's down. Uh, go to a go to a stadium and watch a football game, and and if it's the home and, and the home, suppose the, the the visiting team has you know intercepted the ball and, and scored two touchdowns right away. You have eighty thousand people in the stadium sitting on their hands, not doing anything. They're not yelling. They're not screaming. They're dead silence. And until the home team does something, they won't come alive. We're all influenced. And I, you know, I've been in those crowds. I'm sitting there going, hmm. You know, like we're all influenced by what's going on around us. And so it's not just political, it's social as well. Um, and that's just the way the human, li human life I is. That's true. Um, they're supposed to resist um, majoritarian desires to do things that are not according to the rules of the Constitution. They're supposed to resist that. That's their job. Um, I, and I think that they have done that in the past. They don't do it as often as I would like to see them do it, but they have done it um, because they view their mission as some, to a higher calling, which is to the law. Uh, or to the Constitution itself, as opposed to politics. That's why I'm not like loving to see governors and senators on there, because I don't think that they view their mission the same way as a justice does, even out of the culture, uh, out of the culture that we have. Uh, so yes, they're supposed to do that. All I'm saying is there's a limit to what you can expect them to do, because they're only people.
and they get influenced by what's going on around them like everybody else does and that's what our history has shown. They've done it up to a point but they can be faulted for not doing it better but on the other hand we can understand why they didn't do it better because they're only human. I don't think, I'm not somebody who thinks that progress is inevitable. I think that you can go back and you can regress. We, we've had a long progressive arc and therefore we think it's, we're on some kind of uh, historical inevit historically inevitable uh, uh, timetable and I don't think that's true. I actually think we can, we can screw it up um, and it could be all gone eventually. So I, I, I wish I could be that kind of, I'm an optimist in the, th in the sense that I think that as long as we're allowed some modicum of liberty that the forces of liberty can eventually prevail but I also believe that there has always been and will always be forces who wish to control people uh, and then there will always be a desire for security that would cause some individuals, in fact many individuals, to put their faith in, uh, uh, in, in leaders who actually are more interested in control and to give up their liberty. So uh, I don't think the battle for liberty will ever be entirely won because I think it's a, there's a perpetual clash between liberty and security that will always cause the forces of power to, uh, to exist and to always fight back. Uh, all we can do is keep the flame of liberty alive. Um, even though I do think it's possible for that flame to go out, I'm optimistic that we'll keep it alive.